Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us this morning. If it's your first time watching with us, welcome to Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us this morning. I just have a couple reminders and announcements for us. The first being we have additional resources available below in the description box of this video. We have a link there to take you to get some sermon notes. There's a link to take you to the Friendship Register to submit your prayer request to um, give online. And we also have a link there, a couple links actually, to take you to the kids' ministry um, sermons for this morning. So if you have a child that you would like to have um, some additional resources for them this morning as well, there are additional things for them below in the description box. And just a couple of announcements that the first thing is that next month in July, um, I believe it's the last weekend of July, we're going to be having our VBS for our kids. So it's going to look a little bit differently this year. We're going to actually be bringing VBS to your house. We're going to be doing an online VBS called Mystery Island, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure to sign up your kids to register. And I believe that if you register them before the end of this month, June, they are able to get a free t-shirt. So go ahead and do so right now if you have a child and want to get them involved. And another announcement related to students, we have student ministry starting back up tonight at 6 p.m. outside of the church. So make sure to, to just jump into those additional things that we have available for all the family. And we also do have online services and then we have our outdoor service that we are hosting right now too throughout this um, season of the different phases that we are currently in we are doing an outdoor service so right now we actually have an outdoor service so if you live close by to the church we welcome you to come and join us if not we invite you to join us next week as well but now let's join together as we sing Oh, 
150 says, praise the Lord, praise God in in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his great excellences, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud uh, crashing cymbals. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this morning, that's what we're doing. We are praising God through song this morning. We're reading through his word and studying it. And we know that all throughout scripture, we see how praise is a powerful weapon during the battle, during the storm. A few weeks ago in midweek service, if you're watching with us, I mentioned the story of Job and how when he is when he is tried, when he faces all these different trials and he loses his children and then he loses all his possessions, the first thing that Job does is he falls down and worships God. We see that's a perfect example of how praise is a powerful weapon in our storms and in different circumstances that we face in life. And this morning, we're going to be learning a new song together. And this song, it calls us and reminds us to praise God in the middle of the storm. It calls us to to praise Him in every single moment of our lives. Because we know that when we praise God, we are reminding ourselves of who He is. He is worthy. He is great. He is powerful. And we know that Jesus, that He's already won the victory. So we have to remind ourselves to praise Him. And that's what we're gathered this morning to do. So I'm going to teach you the chorus. The song is called, We Praise You. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you.
be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who could stand before the
we praise you. We know that you are the great I am. God, we know that there is none beside you, Lord, as we just sing right now. And God, that's why we praise you this morning. We praise you because we know that you are over all of it, Lord. You've already won the battle. And that's why we praise you, God, because you are worthy of all the honor and all the praise and all the glory. You are the great I am. And you always have been and you always will be. So God, we just pray that we would be reminded of that every single day of our lives, that we would not forget who you are and who you always will be and have always been. God, we thank you that you remain the same, that you remain constant every single day of our lives and that you are right here with us right now and that you are always with us. So we praise you, God. We thank you for this time that we're able to just express our thanks and our our adoration to you, Lord, because we just want to give it all to you, God. We want to give you all the worship and all of the praise and all the glory because we are just in awe of how great you are, God. We've seen you, God, in our lives, the way that you work. And God, we, we just are so amazed at who you are. So God, we praise you and we thank you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So good getting to sing with you all. And we, you can actually get your Bibles out right now. We're going to open up the word of the Lord together this morning. And we are starting a brand new series. So would you turn your attention now as we open up the word of God together and worship him as we study his word. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Faith Community Church. I am uh, what they used to call in the old days, filling the pulpit. That was a, a phrase that people used years ago. Pastor Bob uh, was a, is away for a few days celebrating his, better get it right, 42nd wedding anniversary. So send him an email, give him a call, say hi to him, and wish him, a happy, him and Cheryl a happy anniversary. We are excited that we're going to be starting a brand new series today, and uh, it's called 2020 Vision, Looking at the World Through a Biblical Lens. And if you wear glasses or contacts, you know what it's like to go to the eye doctor, and they put you in that little machine, and they start twirling the lenses, and they ask you if this is clear, can you see better? And you know how awkward that is when everything's kind of blurry? And finally, they click it to the right place, and you're, you feel this kind of comfortable, uh, ah, Alice, that's great. Now I can see clear. It's kind of like that when we look at biblical doctrines in the Bible, topics in the Bible. We want to get a clear vision uh, and understand God's Word. So uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, the attributes of God. Theology, that's the study of God, and you're familiar with many different ologies in the secular world, biology, pathology, it's the study of these certain areas. Well, in the Christian world, there's ologies too. There's Christology, the study of Christ, ecclesiology, the study of the church. But today we're going to look at theology, or what they call theology proper, the study of God himself. Now, many a times we look at theology, and we use it in a broad term to talk about God and his works, and everything in the church and the Christian realm, but in particular, theology proper is looking at God himself, his personality traits, and his character. So the title of this message this morning is Getting a Clear Vision of the Attributes of God. Now, I want to recommend a book to you that I think everybody should have on their shelves. This is called Bible Doctrine, Essential Teachings of the Christian Faith, by Wayne Grudem, and he writes in his preface, uh, he says, the study of Bible doctrines, or the broader term theology, is not meant to be dry and boring. It's the study of God and all of his works. He says, I've tried to make biblical doctrines, what he wrote about, understandable, even for Christians who have never studied the Bible before. I've avoided using technical terms without first explaining them. And then he says this, theology is meant to be lived, prayed, and sung, praising the Lord, singing words, that is theology. 
when rightly studied theology will lead us to grow in Christ, to grow in our Christian lives, and to worship God in a greater way. So we're starting a summer series this morning that's going to take us into the fall, into September, and um, I trust that the Lord is going to really bless as we learn more about theology, Christian doctrines, Christian topics in the Bible. So before we get started, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the men over the centuries who have given their lives to study your word in in a deeper way and write these books so that we can be blessed. And um, we thank you that today we get to study about who you are, your actual personality, your character, and uh, we're excited about learning more about who you are. And we pray that you would be glorified this morning and that you would work through us, that we might glorify you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we think about the attributes of God, the word attribute is defined as this, a quality or characteristic of a person, place, or thing. That's kind of the generic definition, but it ties right into the attributes of God. We're looking at the quality or the characteristics of God, God the Father. And many theologians categorize these character traits or attributes in two different ways. There's the incommunicable and communicable. Now, you'll probably never use those words for the rest of your life, but they're good terms to understand, at least for today's discussion or sermon. Incommunicable are those qualities or character traits that God possesses that we're never going to share. He is perfect. He is infinite. Some of those, uh, Pastor Bob's going to talk about next week, God's omnipotence, he's all-powerful, his omniscience, he knows everything, and his omnipresence, he's everywhere at the same time. We're never going to share those, even when we get to heaven. So those are incommunicable attributes. But today, I want to look at the communicable, or a few of the communicable attributes. Those are the qualities or character traits that God does share with us with his children, those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ. Now, when I was a brand new believer, I used to think of the attributes of God sort of like a pie, a slice of a pie. There was God's love and a slice of God's forgiveness and a slice of God's mercy. And when you looked at this big pie, that was God. But I learned later that God is 100%, not pieces of a pie. Each one of his attributes are 100%. God is fully loving and fully merciful and fully forgiving, 100%, and all of these things are in the perfection of God and make him so different than us. But even in those differences, he wants to share or he wants us to imitate these attributes in our own lives. Now, one of the main things I want you to learn this morning is that God possesses these communicable attributes, but he wants to share them with us. He just doesn't keep them to himself. This is different than the personality traits that we might have God owns these, possesses them, but he wants to share them and communicate them to us. And when we imitate those, then he is glorified and other people are blessed by uh, these attributes. And I thought of a great verse just to ground us in this uh, topic this morning of God's attributes. It's Ephesians 5.1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So God wants us to imitate these attributes that he possesses. So this morning, we want to sort of adjust our lenses, look more clearly, and get a 2020 vision as it relates to God's communicable attributes. And the first one I want you to look at is God's truthfulness. After each one of these, I want to give you a little definition that is in Wayne Grudem's book, and he says this about God's truthfulness. God's truthfulness means that he is the true God and that all of his knowledge and words are both true and the final standard of truth. Now, this is a major theme in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel because at different times, they just seemed like they would not totally believe that God was the true God. Uh, They were always drifting, always doubting, always worshiping false gods at different times in their history. And that's the eventual judgment that came on the nation of Israel as they were exiled and scattered through the whole world because of their worshiping of false gods. They were not recognizing consistently that God was the only true God. 
Jeremiah 10, verse 10 and 11 says this, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them, The gods that did not make the heavens or the earth will perish. All the false gods perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Isn't that a great set of verses that just proclaims God's truthfulness, that he is the one true God? Now, this attribute of God is foundational to our whole lives as believers, both temporal and eternal. It affects everything when you think about it. We have to start with the premise and the basic belief that there is only one true God, and this one true God who is the standard of all truth wrote a book, the Bible, and he is the God of the Bible, the one true God who has all knowledge, and the one true God's words are not only true, but the final standard of all truth. You see, if God's character is not total truthfulness, then, and if he can lie at different times, then we really can't trust him. If he changes or sometimes doesn't tell the truth, if he doesn't keep his promises, then everything we base our faith upon, our whole lives, would just fall apart. We would have no confidence, no certainty, no hope for the future. We, we wouldn't know if one, he said one thing in the Old Testament and another thing in the New Testament. Is that really true? So this truthfulness of God, this attribute, is so important to the foundation of our Christian lives. On the other hand, if God is truthful, then what happens? It gives us peace and joy and confidence, not only for this present life, but also for eternity. We don't have to worry or be anxious. When he tells us how to get to heaven in his word, we can believe him and trust him through Jesus Christ. That's the only way to heaven. When he says that he loves us, we can believe him. When he says that he will provide and care for us, we can totally trust him because he's truthful. When he says that he works all things together for good to those who love him, we can totally place our faith and our trust in that truth because he is truthful. But remember the definition, God's attributes are to be shared with us. We are to imitate them. We see this way back in the Old Testament with the Eighth Commandment, the Eighth of the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. He wants us to tell the truth. He, we are not to be liars. Psalm 15, 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth right from his heart. Proverbs 13, verse 5, a righteous man hates falsehood and hates lying. And then finally, Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10 says this, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self, after you got saved, you laid that aside with its evil practices and then put on the new self, put on Jesus Christ, who being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So these attributes or these commands not to lie represent God. So we represent him and these attributes flow from him to us and they're to flow through us as we imitate God. So we can begin to see the shared effect of these attributes that God possesses. They originate with him. We receive blessings from them. And then we honor God by imitating them. And horizontally, other people are blessed when we uh, exhibit these attributes of God. But there's a second attribute that originates with God and gets shared with us, and it's God's goodness. God is a good God. The definition is the goodness of God means that God is the final standard of good and all that God is and all that God does is good. And we see many different references, just to name a few. Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 106, verse 1, Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Now, one thing we need to remember about God is that he doesn't like it when people doubt his goodness. 
We see this with the nation of Israel so clearly when he led them out of the promised land and they're out in the wilderness complaining against God and saying they wish they could go back to Egypt into slavery because there's better food there. And they were totally denying the Lord's goodness. And he got really ticked about that. You remember Moses had to pray and to intercede for the people or God was just going to wipe them out. So when we doubt God's goodness, uh, he doesn't really like that too much. Imagine if you were blessing someone and showing love to somebody, trying to do good to somebody. Maybe you took them into your house and they lived with you or you were uh, helping them financially. They lost their job and all of a sudden in the corner at church or somewhere you hear that they're kind of talking behind your back or sort of bad rapping you a little bit. Wouldn't that just put a knife right through your heart after all the things that you were trying to do good, uh, the good that you were trying to do for that person? Think about how God feels just with millions and millions of people. Sometimes even we disobey in this area and we doubt God's goodness. It, it must give him grief and pain when we do this. We see this doubting of God way back in the Garden of Eden when Satan was tempting Eve. And she's looking around and Satan says, uh, you, you mean you can't eat from this one tree? And she, Satan is causing doubt in Eve's mind about the goodness of God. There's all these different trees that they can eat from, but Satan is trying to make her think that God is not good. We see this sin all the way back in the Garden of Eden. But doesn't it give you great comfort to know that God is perfectly good? Doesn't it cause you to want to praise him, to know that he is perfectly good and you can totally trust him, that he loves you and wants to do good? even when things don't seem like they're going well or going good. So knowing and imitating God's attributes can actually bless us. Knowing that God is good can give us peace and confidence. It can cause us to trust him more. But not only is God good in his character, uh, possessing this attribute of goodness, he does good things, things in keeping with his character. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Matthew 7.11, Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So we're not just talking about God possessing this attribute of goodness. He does good things, and he also wants us to imitate his goodness. I think two of the greatest blessings in Wayne's book, he uses the, the attributes of mercy and grace, and he puts them under the category of God's goodness. So his mercy and grace flow from this attribute of goodness. And I think about salvation. These are probably the two that we're the most familiar with, thinking about the mercy that God showed us when we got saved and the mercy that he shows us every single day and the grace, mercy, God giving us what we, not giving us what we deserve and grace is giving us what we don't deserve. And we see so clearly that this attribute, that he wants us to act upon it, to imitate him in Galatians 6 verse 10. The Apostle Paul says this, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of faith, other believers in church. God wants us to do good to all people, but especially to those, our brothers and sisters in the faith. So we can imitate God's goodness to others in the same way. When we think about mercy and the mercy and grace that we've received, we can extend that and should extend that to other people. Forgiving people when they don't deserve to be forgiven. Not retaliating or giving people what we think they deserve. Withholding that, just like God did to us. Giving people things that they don't deserve. A kind word, a card, a gift, a prayer. Other means to show goodness. Things that they don't deserve. So we see God sharing communicating his attributes. He possesses them. He shares them. We are blessed, and we are to bless others by these attributes. Number one, we see his truthfulness and his goodness. But notice verse uh, attribute number three. 
God's love. The definition is really simple but powerful. God's love means that God eternally gives of himself to others. And as soon as I read that definition, I thought about that Greek word agape love. Not the romantic, passionate, eros Greek word for love, and not the phileo, the Philadelphia brotherly love. This is that self-sacrificing, giving uh, agape type of love that we've learned about in the past. It's a love that moves someone to action, to do something. It's a love that looks out for the well-being of others without thinking about our own uh, issues. We just sacrifice and try to love and help that person. This is the love that Jesus showed us at the cross. Romans 5.8, that real familiar memory verse that we have heard so many times, but God demonstrates he does something. He shows action. He demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love and action stems from God's nature. 1 John, uh, 1, verse 4, 1 John 4, verse 8 says, God is love. He is love, but he also does loving things. But I want to, for a moment, take you a little bit deeper with this topic of love, because we get a glimpse of this before anything was even created in the Trinity. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as they were in heaven. John uh, chapter 17, verse 24, Jesus, and he's making this prayer to the Father before he goes to the cross. And he says, Father, I desire that they, the apostles, and also us today, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. He's going to die on the cross and go to heaven. He's praying that we will be with him in heaven someday. So that they may see my glory with you, the glory that you have given me. And here it is, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So we see this love going on in the Trinity in heaven between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit before anything was even created. And we see this conversation happening in the Trinity also in the beginning book of Genesis, in chapter 1, verse 26, where it says, And God says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And I thought about this. What does it mean to be in God's image or in his likeness? It means that he wants us to be imitating all these attributes that he has. And that was the beginning of it. Let us create man in our image so that when they grow up and they can be showing these attributes, not only will God receive glory, but other people will be blessed as we show and imitate the attributes of God. So here's the pattern in a, of sharing this in a broader sense. First, we see the love in the Trinity before we are created. We're created in God's image. God wants us to be like him. Mankind falls into sin. Jesus shows love by coming to the earth, dying on a cross so that we could be with him. And people who trust Jesus receive this love, and then we give away this love to other people and imitate God. Isn't that an awesome truth that God's personality traits aren't just stagnant? He doesn't just kind of sit, you know, they're just not stagnant. He wants them to be used and radiating through us. John 13, 34, and 35 says, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. He's talking in the upper room to his disciples before he goes to the cross. Even as I have loved you, so, so that you also may love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when we have an FELC graduation party or some other event and different people are coming that might not know Christ and they're walking around, we're hoping and praying that they, they kind of feel this vibe that we love one another, and we're serving together for their benefit. We're serving food, and we're preaching the gospel when they come, and we're taking care of their children, and they sense that we have a love for each other. We see this love principle again in the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and the, the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in one sense, we see kind of the shape of the cross, if we can use that illustration. We see this vertical love, the attributes coming from God to us, and then we see them being shared and being acted out in our lives to bless other people. And we know that God first loved us, 1 John 4, 19, and we 
are called to imitate this agape love, this self-sacrificing love, and we bring glory to God and we bless other people with that. Isn't it fascinating to study the attributes of God and learn more about these? So we get a, we're getting a clearer vision on the attributes of God. We see his truthfulness, we see his goodness, we see his love, and number four, we see God's holiness. God's holiness. Here's the definition. God's holiness means that he is totally separated from sin and devoted to seeking his own honor. Now, here we see an attribute that is shared and communicated by God, but it's probably one of the most mysterious or hard to, maybe hard to obey, hard to understand, hard to identify with. Think about it. We live in this fallen world. Every day that we get up, we live in this place where there's sin all over the place. There's sin on the news. Uh, other people sin against us, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, we have our own sin that we deal with. We're just living in the saturated place of sin in this fallen world. But we worship this God who's totally outside and totally perfect and totally holy. And sometimes it's hard to grasp that. We, we can't understand what it's like to live in a place where there's absolutely no sin. And we have the promises that someday we will be there. But for now, it's an interesting and mysterious kind of topic. It almost seems like holiness is an incommunicable attribute that he would not share with us. But we see uh, the, the beginning of God sharing this attribute, communicating this attribute way back with the nation of Israel. God chooses one man, Abraham. He forms the nation of Israel. You know that they were in slavery in Egypt. They were freed. They were in the wilderness. God gives them the Ten Commandments and all his laws. And he gives them this whole system of animal sacrifices, this whole uh, system of showing him that they can't just walk into his presence any old time and just treat him as if he's just like their buddy down the street. He is totally separate. He is totally holy. So there's this whole sacrificial system the consecrating of the tabernacle, the blood sacrifices, the holy of holies that the high priest could only go in there one time a year. And then there's the holy priesthood. Giving the nation of Israel this picture of how different, how distinct, how separate God is from his creation. And then he tells them in Exodus 19, verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God was taking this one nation and separating them from all the other pagan nations, and he wanted to show his glory through this one nation. He was separating them, making them distinct and holy for his purposes. So we see again that he's not just possessing this attribute all to himself. He wants to share it with us. Leviticus 19.2, verse 2 says, You shall be holy, speaking to us, speaking to his people in the Old Testament, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And we hear the same words again in the New Testament to believers, to Gentile believers even today. 1 Peter 1, verse 14 through 16 says, As obedient children, speaking to us, followers of Christ, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior because it is written, Here's the Leviticus reference, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And then Peter says again in chapter 2, you also as living stones are being built up in a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. So it started in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel, and we read about it again for us today as Gentiles. God wants us to imitate his attribute of holiness, to be separate, to be distinct, to be different, to be set apart for his unique and glorious purposes. Now today we don't offer up bulls and lambs and goats, but as Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies to him every day, every moment, as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. But I was thinking about how do we actually pursue holiness and imitate God? This could 
certainly be a whole sermon, if not a sermon series in itself, but I wanted to find something that sort of summarized what it means to be holy. Does it mean that we are to totally be a monk and separate ourselves from the culture? Does it mean that we're supposed to create these lists of do's and don'ts and sort of have a legalistic approach to being different? C.J. Mahaney, in his book called Worldliness, teaches that it's not so much about the lists of do's and don'ts. I can't listen to this song. I can't go to this movie. He talks about it more as the issues of the heart. I like what he says in his book. He says, so often as believers, we are ignorant of the signs of worldliness. This is the opposite of holiness. This is loving the world, following the world's pattern. This was just like the comparison of the nation of Israel acting like the pagan nations that were surrounding them and becoming just like them. He says, we are often ignorant of the signs of worldliness. People can attend church, sing songs, listen to sermons, but inside, the person is drifting. He or she sits in church, but are not excited to be there. They sing songs with no passion or no affection. They listen to preaching without being convicted. They hear the word of God, but don't apply it. He says, a love for the world begins in the soul, in the heart and the soul. It is subtle, not always obvious to others, and often undetected. Sin does not grieve the person like it once did, and passion for Jesus begins to cool. Excitement lessens for serving God and participating in church. Eagerness to share the gospel starts to wane, and growth in godliness slows to a crawl. I thought that was a powerful way to look at what is the opposite of holiness. It's to be worldly, and it's to be like everybody else around us. So there's no distinction between us and other people who don't know Christ. And maybe you're thinking up to this point, you know, you're saying, you know, Tony, I, I'm tracking with you so far. You, I can understand the truthfulness of God. I, I love truth. I like being truthful. I can understand the goodness of God. I want to be good to my neighbor. I, I love the love of God. I, can, I love doing good things and loving things for other people. But this area is a little bit different. And I would just challenge you to pray to God. Don't think about the list and do's, the list of legalistic lists of do's and don'ts. Pray to God and ask Him, what's an area that you need to change something in your life to be more holy, more godly? There's something you need to get rid of. There's something you need, you need to, to add, to start doing in your life, to become more like Jesus, more like God, more holy, like this attribute of holiness that God shares with us and wants us to imitate just pray to him and ask him and he'll show you maybe even right now as i'm speaking you're already thinking as i'm reading that quote by cj mahaney and the lord is convicting you and and speaking to you and that there's something in your life that's not holy and that that you need to change so these attributes of god are shared and communicated to us god's attribute of truthfulness goodness love and holiness and finally we look at the last one, God's attribute of righteousness or justice. I put those two words there because as I was studying, I learned that the, these English words are interchangeable in, not only in the Hebrew but in the Greek. If you look at the definition of justice, you're going to see righteousness in that definition. If you look at the definition of righteousness, you're going to see justice. So we use these terms interchangeably, even in the original languages, and the definition is this, God's righteousness means that God always acts in accordance with what is right and is himself the final standard of what is right. You see a commonality there that in all these definitions, he's the final standard. No matter what attribute it is, he's the fun, God is the final standard. And here, it's what is right. Listen to how this attribute is so powerfully affirmed in a few verses. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says this, The rock, his work is perfect, speaking of God, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And then Isaiah 45, verse 19 says, I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. Now, I don't know how you've been feeling watching all this crazy activity in our world and our country on the news these days 
with the Black Lives Matters and all the riots and the things that are going on in our society today, there seems to be two different camps. There's the one camp that celebrities and politicians and news outlets are sort of just ignoring everything that's going on. Lawlessness seems to be just spreading all over the country. Historical monuments are just being torn down. It doesn't matter what it really represents. They're tearing them down. Um, people are approving of burning the flag. Nobody's uh, enforcing the law in any different place. There's looting, burning, even killing of police officers. And then the other camp is those who are just kind of shocked and appalled and standing back and going, I can't believe this. It's like watching some kind of weird movie and uh, trying to understand and be sympathetic on the one hand of the Black Lives Matters, but then seeing all these other groups kind of getting involved. And in a general sense, just feeling like our country is rapidly changing for the worst. And it made me think totally to this attribute of God being just and righteous how appropriate that we're thinking and talking about this one attribute and all of them, really, because of what's taking place in our culture today. Doesn't it give you a feeling of peace that there is somebody, God in heaven, that is just and righteous? Someone who is the final authority? Someone that will one day will take away all the chaos and the sin in this world and he's going to make it right as we live with him in heaven someday? Someone that there's a an authority figure that's not a Democrat or a Republican who is not biased in any way, not politically motivated to withhold the law or not enforce the law, cannot be bought or bribed. It gives me comfort. And when we see all these uh, things on the news and maybe your heart is troubled, just trust in God and look back at the spiritual side and think about there is somebody that is going to make everything right someday. And there's somebody that we can trust who is totally righteous and totally just in all his decisions. You know, I was thinking, isn't this a great way in our culture today for Satan to just totally take our mind off of the spiritual, eternal things? Everybody's so looking at the TV and the news and thinking so much on a horizontal level. There's not many people really thinking about God and thinking about Jesus Christ these days. But this attribute really at its core, points to the most important questions of life. Is there a judge? Is there a righteous standard? What happens when we die? Where will I spend eternity? Is there really a judgment? And these are the true and the important questions of life, not this horizontal stuff that's going on today. I love this quote by Wayne Grudem in, in his book. He says, As a result of God being just and righteous, it is necessary that he treat people according to what they deserve. That's something that we're totally not seeing in our society today. It is necessary that God punish sin, for it doesn't deserve a reward. It is wrong and deserves punishment. Completely the opposite of what we're seeing in our culture today. You see, if God did not punish sin, he wouldn't be righteous and he wouldn't be just. And we would have no reason to trust him. We would be asking, as we're asking today, isn't somebody going to make this right? Isn't somebody going to deal with the situation? Isn't somebody going to do something about this lawlessness? We would be asking the same questions about God if he were not totally, perfectly just and righteous. I love Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31 says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of, of, times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, that's Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And God is going to make it right someday. He is going to judge all the lawlessness. But praise God that when you know Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So he's going to judge, but right now he's patiently waiting for people to repent. And when I was, I was looking at these attributes, you know what's fascinating? At the cross, we see the pinnacle of all of God's attributes coming together, don't we? We see his truthfulness in John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. There is his truthfulness. We see his goodness in the fact that he shows mercy and grace to us, to sinners who don't deserve that. Tied into the cross, we see his agape love. God sending action, putting love into action, sending his own son, Jesus being willing to come to the earth, action, showing his love in action, and dying on a cross for our sins. We see his holiness at the cross because God only accepts a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then we see, as we just talked about, his righteousness and justice is seen by his Son taking the punishment for our sins. The sins have to be punished if God is righteous and just, but God allowed a substitute, and Jesus Christ took those sins. So we see all of God's attributes coming together, all merging together at the cross that Jesus Christ hung on. So you see, there's a reason that we need to learn about theology. It's not to just kind of be a bunch of eggheads studying a bunch of things that don't matter to get more Bible facts in our brain. These things impact us, and and God wants us to imitate these things. Wayne Grudem closes this section in his book with a quote that I thought was very powerful. He says, if God were a God of perfect righteousness, but without the power to carry out that righteousness, he would not be worthy of worship. And we would have no guarantee that justice would prevail in the universe. But if there is a God of unlimited power, that's the incommunicable attribute. Yet without righteousness in his character, how unthinkably horrible the universe would be. There would be unrighteousness at the center of all the universe, and there would be nothing anyone could do about it. Just like the things that we're seeing in our culture, it seems like. So we ought to continually thank God for his attributes. He's totally perfect. All of these things work together so that they, we can praise him, and he wants us to imitate this th- these attributes. So I hope this morning that you have a new appreciation and a love for God a love for his attributes and understanding that he wants to communicate these and share them with us, his truthfulness, his goodness, his love, his holiness, his justice, his righteousness. And the challenge for us today is to understand them, to study them, to appreciate them, to imitate them in our own lives. And I want to just close with this one statement. God's attributes originate with him. He shares them with his children. They are to be lived out so that God will receive glory and the lives of people will be changed. When we live out and imitate his attributes, unbelievers can be changed as they see us living out and being more like Christ. Hopefully they're curious about who Jesus is. And certainly when we live out these attributes, God's children, our brothers and sisters, are also blessed. So it's this vertical and horizontal action coming from God and working in and through us. Isn't it awesome to know that God's attributes, he wants to share them with us and he wants us to imitate them. Let's do that today, this week, and for the rest of our Christian lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these great truths about your attributes. We know that these are just a few of them, but we're just so convicted that Uh, We want to imitate them because we see a little bit more clearly that you just don't possess them for yourselves. You share them and you communicate them and we learn about them and your word and then you want us to imitate them. You want us to do that because it brings glory to you and it blesses other people, whether unbelievers or believers. So, Father, thank you for making it a little bit more clear uh, what these attributes are all about and we look forward next week to hearing about your incommunicable attributes, those that where you're so different from us that we want to also praise you for those too. So thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week in Jesus.
to make praise our our weapon that we go to that we turn that when we're in the middle of a storm we're in the middle of a battle even in the good that we would choose to praise Jesus in every single moment of our lives and just a reminder that we are meeting outside right now so if you would like to join us next weekend here at Faith Community Church in the West parking lot we are meeting at 845 and it's been a blessing so we invite you to come join us if not we will see you back online here on eight on Sunday morning at 845 as well be blessed and have a great week in the Lord